Hello, it's Bob Waskowitz from ST Microelectronics Staff Engineer, back with part six of our nine part video series on the STM 32L5 Trust Zone. In part six, we're going to take a non secure application and add it to the trusted application, which we did in hands on number two. This brings us to hands on number three. So we're going to expand on hands on number two and this time, the secure application is going to make the jump to the non-secure and call a non-secure, adding a second LED blinking, the blue one, at a one-second rate. So hands-on number three came from the GPIO toggle trust zone. A secure, non-secure setup is a dual project, and I have a couple slides down the road here to talk about that. So as mentioned, secure is going to blink the green, non-secure is going to blink the blue. So once again, IAR 8.40.2 was used to compile the hex files that you have. The secure blinky project will now configure the secure application, so it's going to release the GPIO that's needed to blink, the, for the blue LED to blink. And the non-secure blinky project will be configured as a non-secure project within the this dual project of IAR. I had, we mentioned about this non-secure callable API. So the secure has to release the GPIO. There are secure faults which are passed back and forth. So this secure.nsc non-secure call of a library is generated when you generate the secure project and it's linked in to the non-secure project. So I'll show you that in a few slides with the IAR. The physical location of these projects, so one's going to start the secure project at the beginning of bank one, which is at C00000. And then if you remember the secure, the non-secure bank two starts at 8040000. And I'll show you that in the linker file as the way they're set up. Reminder slide, you've seen this before when we were doing the secure uh, project. So basically, flash one and two set up for secure, non-secure, SRAM one, SRAM two set up as secure by the SAU. And then the SAU global trust zone controller, we're really not using any peripherals that are controlled by that since the GPIO is trust zone aware. So we don't have to but if we were using a UART or a SPY or something, then we'd have to set the global trust zone controller up. The trust zone has been enabled. We've configured the secure memory one watermark and the secure memory two watermarks. So nothing to do here, just a reminder. Once again, another reminder that how the secure watermarks are configured. If the start address is greater than the end address, then that whole bank is. But if you need to carve out certain, if you need more memory, more flash, then you can set up particular sectors to do what you want to do. So here are the two slides coming up that I talked about the, the flow of developing secure and non-secure applications. Each application is independent, is generated independently of the other. The secure project exports this NCS live file, which is the the gateway, this NCS callable from the secure to the non-secure. The non-secure is linked against that secure gateway library. So the build order is very important when you look at the examples within the how. So you need to build the secure project first, then you build the non-secure project. So the tool chain IDE compiler, whether it's IAR Kyle or the Cube IDE, needs to be aware of the secure side. So there's a bit that we're going to set, and we're going to determine which one is secure, which one is non-secure, as you've seen. The, the language extensions are important as far as the API going back and forth. And the extra instructions for the different states of the core need to be aware, need to be made aware of. 
from a non-secure project side, you can develop that. That's just like developing its own application, and you configure it the way you normally would with allocation of peripherals and stuff in the normal HAL, and can be debugged and checked out individually. However, where it's linked to the memory addressing, you do need to be aware of where you're locating it, and I will show you that in the uh, pool chain configuration slides. So again, we're going to talk a little bit about the flow and the modifications of the main. I'm not going through the sys init and startup, the SAU, all that stays the same. We just said the global trust zone controller. We're not configuring that because the peripherals we're using um, don't need to be configured. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about those commented out sections that you previously saw. So we need to tell the non-secure side which I.O. is available. So we're going to uncomment that section out for this secure side, which we see. And then also we're going to allocate all everything except for the green LED port pin to the non-secure side. A little extreme, but this makes all the GTIO available then on the non-secure side. Once we release the GPIO, the next modification is to allow the jump to occur from the secure side to the non-secure side. This is the uh, non-secure init, and you'll see that the jump is actually to uh, VTOR table underscore non-secure start address, and that physical address is listed up in the defines as 804,000, and that's the first, that's the start. So if you're changing the memory, if you're changing the flash location of this, if you're reallocating more than half and a half, three quarters, one quarter, this is the area that you would change. In addition to this, there's also this output file that's created, and I'll show you that in the IAR configuration, which is that non-secure live output, and that's the link that, so the non-secure project will have to link this in to make it aware of what I.O. is non-secure and going back and forth between the two regions for the uh, faults as well. So if we look at the IAR configuration, we've got the trust zone enabled, make it aware. This is the secure project for the trust zone. If we look at the linker file, it's going to be the same as the previous hands-on example. We're locating the secure code in bank one, which is at C00000. Same for the flash ROM. We're using the whole bank for that. And the SRAM is going to be at 300,000. The output of the secure NSC live.a binary is what's new. So if I look at the linker, this file is output from the secure project, and this file will be linked in to the non-secure project. So what are we doing from the non-secure side? Again, the same color coding. Blue is normal, and red means I, I made some changes. Um, so we start out with the same sys init call from the secure side. The pound defined for the vector table offset is commented out, so that's not doing anything. So the sys init on the non-secure side does nothing. So what's the first thing that gets done in the main of the non-secure? Well, there's two callbacks set up. One is the secure fault, and the other one is the global trust zone controller error. Remember that GZTC also controls uh, interrupt vector interrupts, which the SysTIC would be using to do this from the non-secure side to the secure side. We get the same warning in the non-secure side about the SysTIC and the time bases and having multiple time bases. And then the HAL init, you know, sets up the SysTIC. So in this case, we do have two separate SysTICs. We have the one on the secure side and the one on the non-secure side, both doing their own independent thing. So the next configuration is the system clock. 
this was also configured on the secure side up to, up to 110 megahertz and the APBs were all configured as well. Unless you're redefining them, there's nothing that's going to happen there. And then we're going to go to the GPIO init. We have to enable the pins for the blue LED and we'll talk a little bit about that next. So Remember, there are three LEDs on the board. We're using the green one for the secure. That leaves the red and the blue not being used. We allocated all the GPIO other than the green LED to the non-secure side. So in this example right now, I'm only we're turning on the clocks for the red and the blue LED. However, we're only using the blue LED. So the non-secure side is going to wind up in a while loop for the main, in which case the SysTick interrupt is then going to determine the blink rate of the blue LED. And in this case, the SysTick callback is set up for 500 milliseconds. So the blue LED is going to blink twice as fast as the green LED is what you're going to see. So on the non-secure side, there is an error handler callback. And right now, out of the box, that's set up to turn on the blue LED solid if it were to happen. However, the while loop has nothing in it. The SysTick is just basically doing its thing, generating an interrupt. So if you want to go into the Cube L5 GPO toggle trust zone example, you could add a LED toggle from the non-secure side and try to toggle that green LED on the secure side, you would generate a secure fault, which would generate the global trust zone controller, would generate this error handler, and then that's how you would eventually like it. Light this. I didn't get, we didn't have enough time in the two hours to do all this, so that may be left up to you to maybe try as a next step. So, what do we configure in the IDE to let it know that this is a non secure application? The trust zone is enabled. And now we have the non-secure mode checked. OK, so where is the linker placing this non-secure application? Well, as previously discussed, the jump on the secure side is going to be to 804,000. So that's where the vector table is going to be. The memory, the flash, is going to be there as well because it's in flash. And then, of course, the SRAM is going to be at the 200,000 range because that's where the non-secure SRAM is. And remember, there was 192K allocated for secure, and the other 64K, I think it was, was allocated for non-secure. And then finally, the non-secure file needs to know where to get that secure underscore ncslive.a file that was created by the secure project. And that's an input then to this non-secure project. This brings us to the actual downloading of the hex files and seeing if they both work, which hopefully they should. So once again, we're going to connect the cube programmer to the ST link on the Nucleo board. So first thing I need you to do is let the default ST link stay as it is, hit the connect button, as we've done twice before. This is going to give you some information, which is telling you that you successfully connected to the Nucleo board. We're going to open the hands-on number three non-secure file first. I want you to disregard this blue uh, tab you see. I forgot, as I told you all in the end of number hands-on number two, to close that. So this is left over from before. So what I want you to do is hit the plus. So you should have the plus um, tab there. And then select Open File, and then browse to where you've located the hex files, and pick the hands-on underscore three underscore ns non-secure dot hex file. Go ahead, load it. You'll see the new tab. Create it. Note that the load address is eight zero four thousand because that's what we just talked about. Next, we're going to load the secure jump file. So Again, we're going to hit the open file or the plus tab, and we're going to browse to the same folder, and we're going to select the 
ANZ1 underscore 3 S for secure jump hex file. We're going to see a new tab open up. And we're going to see the load address of that file is at C00000, just as we saw in hands on number two. We still have the previous hands on number two on the board, so we're going to erase that flash from the secure side. So we're going to select the download icon, and we're going to do a full chip erase, select it just as we did previous. You're going to OK, are you sure you want to erase it? And you're going to hit OK. And then you're going to note the mass erase successfully was achieved. All right, now we're going to program the two files. Remember, the option bytes have already been set, so we have everything ready to go. Bank 1 is secure. Bank 2 is non secure. The SAU is set up for the SRAM. We're good, right? So I want you to. We're going to go back to the uh, select the file editor icon. We're going to load the non-secure first because it's going to just sit there and act dumb, right? Because the way the trust zone boots is it's going to boot basically from secure first. So go ahead and make active the hands-on three non-secure hex file. Again, go over to the download tab. Don't pull. Don't select the pull-down options. OK the file download, and you'll see the information in your log window. These next two steps, 5A and 5B, have a little bit of a story behind it. So I wanted to, I want to show you the pull downs on that download button that we've been using to download the files. So go over to the download pull down, and you're going to see some options for uh, different things. One of those options is verify, and then you're going to see a grayed out address, which is basically the load address of the hex file. And then I want you to select that, and if you've got a successful download from the previous step, all things should verify. And then you acknowledge the verification successfully tab. If you ever get a mismatch, obviously the goal would then be to repeat the download. So. In preparation for this hands-on, the original intent was to use version 2.4 of the Q programmer. Well, we discovered a little bug in 2.4. So when downloading the non-secure file, there's something going on with the SAU configuration. So checking with the division, we realized that there was an error there. They are going to fix the error. They will be fixed in version 2.5. So that's why we're using version 2.3, which brings me to slide 5B. So we're going to re-download again, and if things work, then they're good. So by the SAU having its issue, what would happen would be is one out of two or three times the secure, I'm sorry, the non-secure download would actually fail. And remember that RAS read as zeros? You would get that. That's how I knew there was something wrong with the SAU configuration. So I wanted to throw that in here. Um, again, version 2.4 works for other things, but I did, we did find that bug. So we're using version 2.3. And there will be a new release of the Q programmer coming in June with version 2.5. So again, on the, you would OK the file, file download message, and then you would continue. But hopefully, nobody has any problems. If you do have a problem, repeat these steps. With the non-secure downloaded, we need to download the secure file. So we're going to make the hands-on3 underscore s jump file the active file. We're going to select the download, but don't do the pull downs. And we're going to OK the file download. And we're going to note the long window, long window that the download was complete. So once again, some cleanup operations before we actually run the code. We're going to disconnect the Q programmer from the ST link, and we're going to see that the uh, disconnect happens. And then we're going to close the open files by clicking on the X for each of them. Then we're going to run the application. So all that's needed to do is press the reset button, 
and LED 1, the green, shall blink at the previous two-second rate, and then you'll see the blue LED blinking concurrently next to it, which is coming from the non-secure application. This concludes hands-on number three. So we downloaded a secure, we downloaded a non-secure, the one called the other. The application left to you guys, the attendees, is to maybe go in and add an extra line to the non-secure side, try to toggle the green LED on the secure side, and things should be set up so that you'll get the error and the blue LED will stay lit. You can change that blue LED to the red LED by reconfiguring it to the PA5, as I suggested previously. Thank you for taking the effort to execute part six, our hands-on number three of the nine-part video series on the STM32L5 Trust Zone. I invite you to continue with part seven, which is hands-on number four, which will now show you how to set up the IAR IDE to concurrently debug, go back and forth between the non-secure and the secure, and see some of the symbol data that will be necessary when you're putting these types of applications together.